Welcome to the inside of my F56 Mini John Cooper Works. It's a fantastic car and it's never let me down. Well, mechanically at least, because like a lot of F56 Minis, it does have a very common problem. When I try and load the sat-nav system, I see this. Now, when it started playing up, I thought, I know what to do. I will take the car to the local BMW garage and see if they can fix it. I thought it just needed the software being reflashed onto the head unit. So I left it with them for three days it took. And when it came back, they said they couldn't fix it. In their opinion, the head unit was corrupted, which is not good. And worse, when I got the car back, every time I start it up, it does this. That's very annoying, as you might imagine. For one thing, I have to go through four menu options just to clear the error code. And for another, the car now doesn't remember my phone, the Bluetooth connections, uh, the radio station that I last had it set to. Everything else works on the car, but those things don't. So no sat nav, no remembering the phone and things like that. And it's very annoying. So I've tried everything to fix it and I can't find a good way of fixing it. So the only option left is to change the head unit. And I thought while I'm changing it, I might as well upgrade it for a newer version. That way I get better software and Apple Play as well. So I did talk to BMW about that. Uh, their quote for replacing the head unit was just over 2000 pounds. And even then to change it, it would be the same head unit as I've got now. It would have the newer maps, but that's about the only uh, difference. So what I did was I went online. I found an excellent uh, seller of BMW parts who has supplied me with a brand new head unit. So it's the upgraded head unit. It's the touchscreen display. It comes with a new iDrive controller. Well, they have to be fair. It's the same as the one I've already got, but I might change it um, anyway. Uh, and it's been coded to the car. Most importantly, if you're not familiar with BMWs or Minis, if you're going to change something on the car, you must code it properly. So, for instance, if you're changing a headlight from, say, a Xenon headlamp to an LED headlamp, you've got to code it so the car knows what type of headlight it's running. In this instance, you might say to me, can't I just change the head unit by itself and that'll be fine because the head unit's the same. But the answer is not really, no because the head unit itself is the point of the car where it needs to know what else is on the car. So for instance, this car is very well specced. It's got heated windscreen. It's got a reversing camera. It's got heated seats. Uh, it's got the head up display. There's all sorts of features that the head unit needs to know the car has in order to be able to work properly. And also, and this is a BMW safety feature, the maps won't work unless the map is actually coded to the VIN number on your car. So you can't just go onto eBay and buy a replacement head unit from a smashed Mini and expect it to work. You've got to code the head unit to the car. Now, coding is a whole world of pain. I do have the laptop and the ESIS software and you can have a go at coding yourself, but it's very tricky. So in this instance, the seller I found, who's absolutely brilliant, and I put a link in the description below, I sent him the VIN number for the car, plus all the options that the car has. And so they have coded the unit for me. So I'm assured it's a straightforward plug and play swap. So I thought what we will do is I will show you how to get the old head unit out, how to put the new one in, and that way, if you've got a car that's doing the same thing, and this is a very common fault actually on minis from 2014 to 2016, you could have a go at changing your own head unit. So I say, let's get into it. First thing we have to do is remove this very decorative shield around the outside of the head unit. And it's not too difficult, but it does involve a number of special clips right here at the bottom. There's one on each side. They're little plastic sort of rivet things. And the way to get them out, you can't just put your finger underneath and pull them out. You need something small and thin. So I'm using a very small um, Torx key. And in the center of the plastic uh, rivet, you'll see there's a small pin. You just need to push that pin in a little bit. Don't push it in too far, just push it in a little bit.
Next job, now we've got those two little plastic rivets out, is simply to pull the bezel off of the housing. Uh, it does involve quite a bit of force, but don't worry, you won't break it, but it does seem a little bit scary. So just give it a yank and you'll see what happens. Now that's off, we need to remove two torque screws that are holding the head unit to the dashboard. They are underneath, one here and one here, and we need a T15 Torx driver. One more thing to remove is the speaker cover on the top of the dashboard, because we need access down the back here to get the um, head unit out. So trim removal tool is good for this, or if you're feeling brave, you could use a flat bladed screwdriver lift that up that just pops out now we're almost ready to get the head unit out all we need to do feel around the top here there's a hole right in the center just put something long and thin down that hole because there's a metal clip holding the head unit on at the back we just need to release that clip and then we can pull the head unit forward Then the head unit comes away just like that. Now we need to remove the wires from the back of the head unit. There's only a few and they all pull out uh, and they only go in one way, which is very handy. So you can't get this wrong when you put them back together. Right, that's the old display unit free. There's just a couple more things we need to do to get the actual head unit out because it's buried deep in the dashboard. And that is remove the two air vents either side of the head unit. Not too tricky. There's one screw either side holding the air vent in place and then we just have to lever it out of the hole. Just one more thing now. There are two more screws holding the head unit in place. They're both T15 Torx. So let's get those undone and then we can pull the head unit out. With that done, we simply need to pull the head unit out and start disconnecting the cables. There are a lot of cables, but fear not, the new head unit has exactly the same connections on the back, so that's okay. And also, each one is relatively easy to remove if you know what you're doing. But that's what I'm gonna show you. These connectors, we simply need to pull up this white tab push in and that frees the clip at the bottom and then pull up and we disconnect. This large connector block we need to lift up the lever at the back and as we lift that forward the whole batch of cables will disconnect in one go. The green and the black goes to the um, head up display. Only a few more to disconnect. There's one here. Two more optical cables here. The yellow and the cream. Push the tab in. Pull up. Push the tab in. Pull up. And then finally the pink wire, push in, a 
Right, with those out of the way, the old head unit should come out. And there it is, ready for the bin, or another expert programmer that's better than me to fix it. Right, now we have a big hole and we need to get the new unit in. Right, once the new unit's in, we just need to connect the wires, same colour wires to the same holes as before. Right, with those all in place, push the head unit back into the dash and do up the two torque screws. Next job, put back the air vents. They simply push into place and then one torque screw. Final job, take off the screen protector from our new screen. Lovely. And then connect all the wires back onto the display. Last job, push the head unit back in place on the dash. And put in the two torque screws we took out earlier. Two last jobs to finish off, put the trim ring back on. I have decided to go for the plain black rather than the John Cooper works. I know that might upset some of you. Let me know in the comments below what you feel about um, that. But the ring just pushes on. Same plastic rivets as before. Push the pin out so it's loose. Push in and push the pin together. Should hear it snap. Time to see if it works. Oh, it looks nice. John Cooper works. I like it. Wow, it looks good. One other thing, if you're going to change the iDrive controller, it's a very simple job. Um, I didn't, because the new iDrive controller is exactly the same as the one I've already got. Which does make me think, has someone messed around with this car before? But anyway, if you've got a new iDrive controller, you want to change it, it's very simple. Just undo the plastic ring around the controller. You don't even need any tools, it will literally come off with your fingers. Underneath that plastic ring, you'll see two torque screws. Undo those, lift the iController out. Uh, there's one cable on the back with four pins. Unplug it, put the new one in, put the pins on, and then screw it back in place, and you're good to go. So there we are. Not too bad. What was that? 20 minutes in total. Admittedly, I had to have it coded by someone else, but it was half the price of BMW, wasn't it? So that has been a job that's been bothering me for a long time, um, and it was really easy. Undo some cables, put on some new ones. If I can do it, you can do it too. So good luck with that. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.